Hello to all our viewers and welcome to this special session of our scripture study on the readings. Today, Stan and I are going to be doing a little something different. We're going to begin with the fourth Sunday of Advent. We're only going to look at the gospel, just the gospel for the fourth Sunday. And then Stan and I are going to go and look at the readings for Christmas, Christmas night, because those readings are the ones we use on Christmas Eve. And uh, as you will see, the gospel of Christmas night really tells the story of Christmas. Exactly right, Father. So Stan and I want to concentrate on Christmas night because, and the, the readings are so powerful. And uh, now we have a few reflections to make on Christmas. Exactly. Of course, we begin in prayer in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. We call upon the Holy Spirit to guide us. Come, Holy Spirit, fill the hearts of your faithful. Kindle in us the fire of your love. Send forth your Spirit. We shall be created. And you shall renew the face of the earth. O God, who instructed the hearts of the faithful by the light of your divine spirit, grant us by that same Holy Spirit to be truly wise, to rejoice in your consolation through the same Christ our Lord. Amen. Amen. In the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. We begin with the gospel for the fourth <coughs> Sunday of Advent. Remember, we have this Sunday, and the vigil mass is Sunday morning is for the fourth Sunday of Advent. Sunday afternoon is Christmas Eve. Six hours later, we're into Christmas, Father. So we're changing very quickly from Advent to Christmas. So basically, we have to have the church completely ready for Christmas. We don't have much time. Exactly right. But we're beginning with the gospel. It's from the Gospel of Luke, chapter 2. It's a gospel you're very familiar with, but it does set the tone, prepare us for Christmas. <clears throat> In those days, a decree went up. I'm sorry, I got the wrong gospel here. <laughs> Too many things, Stan. There you go. Now you got it. This is reading from the Gospel of Luke, chapter 1. The angel Gabriel was sent from God. <clears throat> to a town of Galilee called Nazareth, to a virgin betrothed to a man named Joseph of the house of David. And the virgin's name was Mary. And coming to her, he said, Hail, full of grace, the Lord is with you. But Mary was greatly troubled at what was said, pondered what sort of greeting this might be. Then the angel said to Mary, Do not be afraid, Mary, for you have found favor with God. Behold, you will conceive in your womb, bear a son, you shall name him Jesus. He will be great. He will be called the Son of the Most High. The Lord will God will give him the throne of David, his father. He will rule over the house of Jacob forever. And of his kingdom there will be no end. But Mary said to the angel, How can this be, since I have no relations with a man? And the angel said to her in reply, The Holy Spirit will come upon you. The power of the Most High will overshadow you. Therefore the child to be born will be called Holy, the Son of God. Behold, Elizabeth, your relative, has also conceived a son in her old age. This is the sixth month for her who is called barren, for nothing will be impossible for God. Mary said, Behold, I am the handmaid of the Lord. May it be done to me according to your word. Then the angel departed from Mary. The Gospel of our Lord and Savior. Praise to you, Lord, Lord Jesus, Jesus Christ. Every time I hear this gospel stand, I, I think about Mary, this 
young, probably teenage Jewish girl, and so much being thrust upon her. Just to have a vision of an angel would be a lot, I think. That would kind of blow me away, Father. I think I would be kind of overwhelmed. But then the message of the angel is even more overwhelming. So naturally, Mary is upset, she's afraid, she's troubled, she asks questions, she doesn't understand how all this is going to come apart. So to perceive that this was an easy decision for Mary is very unfair. Mary really had to think about it. She had to ponder what the angel was saying. What does it mean that she's full of grace? What does this mean that she will be the mother of the Son of God? Mary really had to struggle and ponder. But in the end, the angel kind of assures her that God's Spirit is with her. And he assures her that her relative Elizabeth, a barren woman who's old, she's conceived a son in her old age. All these are signs that God's plan is unfolding. But I think for our viewers, the important thing is to focus on Mary, on her faith, and on her courage. Exactly right. Anything, Stan? Oh, just a little bit, Father. But uh, you look at Mary there, and uh, she's living in a time when the Jewish people were actively pursuing, actively thinking about the coming of of a a savior figure, of a Messiah. And uh, I think that it's in the, in the back of every, every Jewish person's mind at that time. And now you've got this angel coming and talking to her. And can you imagine how overwhelmed she would have been? It's hard to fathom it. It's hard. Yeah. It, and, and, and she's thinking, this is actually going to happen. It's going to happen to me. Yeah. This is going to happen to me. And how can, how can this be? She says, I'm just a poor little girl. I mean, yeah. how can this happen to me? And I think as you go through this whole nativity story that we're going to go through in the next you know couple days uh what what you're going to find is it seems like god picks the poorest and the weakest and the and the the lowest of of the uh uh, uh, social ladder people to 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 work his work his wonders through Mm -hmm. and i think mary's just the, the first part of this yeah and really mary's yes to god's plan and her obedience to the angel is necessary for the birth of Christ to come about. It's, right. She represents the human race. She reverses the no of Eve, our first mother. And I think the one of the, the last line almost, the gospel is so powerful. For nothing will be impossible for God. And that really sets the tone. It sure does. How because nothing is impossible. Mary could conceive the Son of God and everything that happened seems really impossible. But it works. But it all works. Nothing's impossible for God. Exactly right. And I think even the fact that Elizabeth is a pregnant uh, cousin of hers, it's a few miles away from her, more than a few miles actually, but uh, it is another sign. It's a, wow. a sign for, for Mary itself. But the one thing that, that struck me here, Father, is, is the one gift that God has given us is the gift of free will. And it took Mary's free will to say that yes. Mm-hmm. It didn't take anything else. It took her free will. Yeah. And the rest, uh, so to speak, is history. Yeah. So Mary was filled with the Spirit of God, and she was certainly filled with God's grace. So she had that courage. She said yes. Exactly. Yeah. Mm-hmm. You ready? I'm ready, Father. So now we're going to the Mass for Christmas Eve. This is the night Mass. Some people might say midnight, but we'll just say the night. We'll just say night, yeah. We'll just say night. Okay. <laughs> I got it, Did Father. you know the Pope's Mass, he doesn't do midnight Mass? What does he do it about 8 o'clock? 8 o'clock. There you go. So even the Pope. Our Mass is at 8 o'clock. So I'm about the same time as the Pope. That's you know? right. You're right on the line. Right on the line and with the Pope. you know why he does it at 8 o'clock? Why is that, Father? Because he's old and he's sick. There you go. And he, it's hard to stay up. It's hard to stay up is right. And that's why I don't function well at midnight <laughs> either. None of us do. 
<laughs> just an aside, people. Just, just, just aside. Just aside. So. Okay. Sorry, okay. Sorry for that. That's okay. <laughs> sorry for that. We all need to know. We need to know. <laughs> uh, today, today, people, we're, we're back at our, our, our good friend Isaiah and, uh, for, for the first mass, for the night mass. <clears throat> it's chapter 9, verses 1 to 6. It's the, it's the classic the classic reading for this. This is a wonderful reading. It's a classic for reading. For our viewers, really listen to this reading. It is it's, it's wonderful. Right. Um, the people who walked in darkness have seen a great light. Upon those who dwelt in the land of gloom, a light has shone. You have brought them abundant joy and great rejoicing as they rejoice before you as at the harvest, as people make merry when dividing spoils. For the yoke that burdened them, the pole on their shoulder, and the rod of their taskmaster, you have smashed as on the day of Midian. For every boot that tramped in battle, every cloak rolled in blood, will be burned as fuel for flames. For a child is born to us, a son given us. Upon his shoulder dominion rests. They name him Wonder, or Counselor, God Hero, Father Forever, Prince of Peace. His dominion is vast and forever peaceful. From David's throne and over his kingdom, which he confirms and sustains by judgment and justice, both now and forever, the zeal of the Lord of hosts will do this. The word of the Lord, Father. Thanks be, be to God. God. Beautiful. Yes. Beautiful. Wow. And this is more from Isaiah 1, the time of exile. Yes. And he's, he's writing this to the people that are in Babylon that are, that are already in exile, and, and he's telling them, that this might be a dark time now. Where you're the people that walked in the darkness, okay? But, but you're going to see a great light. There, there's, there's a hope for, for the Jewish people, yeah. a hope for the Jewish people. And, uh, uh, and it says, you, abund you have brought them abundant, go uh, abundant joy and great rejoicing as they rejoice before you as at the harvest. He, he's telling them things, things will be infinitely better than what, what they've got right now. <clears throat> the, word, the verse that got me, Father, was I had to look this up. Go ahead. And it was about the day of Midian. I'm wondering, what in the world is the Midian. day of Midian? Midian, yeah. And um, for you people that, that uh, grab your Bibles, <laughs> okay? <laughs> because cause this is an interesting story. And it's talking about God's power here. And he says, that you, you, you have smashed us on the day of Midian, which means God, God was with them all on this day of Midian. And uh, the day of Midian was uh, back to the book of Judges. Mm -hmm. And there was a, a judge called Gideon, and Gideon was going to fight against the Midianites, and there was a pile of Midianites, and uh, Gideon had, had a pile of guys too. He had maybe 30,000 guys. A lot of men. A lot of men, but they didn't know how the outcome was going to be, and God told Gideon, get rid of your guys, basically. And there was a certain few tests. It ends up, boils down to, he ends up with only 300 men. He says, I want, God says, I want this to be like this because I want you to know that it's me that's doing this and not you. That's true. And uh, so they send these 300 guys, they divide them into three divisions of 100 apiece, and they, and they, give, them, they give them these jars and these horns. <laughs> and they surround this camp in the middle of the night. And uh, the book of Judges says that uh, there, there's so many, they couldn't even count the camels that were there. There was that many camels. <laughs> but that just said how many people were there? There was tons of, tons of people there. So they surround this whole camp in the middle of the night. Can you imagine everybody's asleep? And uh, next thing you know, they're blowing these horns and smashing these, these uh, jars, and they're waving uh, their torches and blowing the horns and hollering, hollering, all, and they surround the whole camp. And in the meantime, they, these camp people wake up, these soldiers. It's just like you getting out of a deep sleep, Father. You get really confused. You don't know what's going on. Right. They start fighting with each other. And uh, it all boils down to uh, Gideon's 300 guys didn't have to raise a sword for anything because God did all the work. And th that's, that's what they're, they're trying to say here with, with Isaiah. He's saying, God's going to handle this w for you just the way he handled things at Midian. Right. Okay? He, doesn't, he doesn't need your help. He will show you the way. He will give you what you need. Yeah. And I thought that was really good. That's, that's a great insight to... Uh, it would seem impossible for a force of 300... To defeat a force of 30,000. 30, right. It would seem impossible, but that's... God's work. God's work. Right. And, yeah. and he, he wanted, Isaiah wanted the, the Jewish people to know at the time, at their lowest point in time, when they're in Babylon, 
and they're down in the dumps, they've been taken away from their homeland, that things are going to get better and God will take care of you. <coughs> yes. Okay, maybe not you personally, but the Jewish people, mm -hmm. you know, uh, he will take care of them then. Yep. So. And that's, that's my Godfather here. This well, is, this is the good. promise. This that's, is the promise. Yeah, no, I, for our viewers, I just, the image of darkness and light is so powerful here. Right. Mm -hmm. You walked in darkness, uh, you dwelt in a land of gloom. It's really powerful, powerful image. But then the hope, they've seen a great light, a light will shine, and that light is the promise ultimately of Messiah, but really it, God's the Messiah. He's the one who's going to be the light. He's exactly right. God is going to <laughs> deliver him, as you said, and uh, eventually people will see that maybe as a future Messiah, but right now it's God who's going to deliver them, and so they, an they anticipate the restoration of, of the Jews back home to their land, and restoration of the people's relationship with God, the re rest restoration of the covenant. All this is so filled with hope, so uh, that everything is going to work out, as you said, and right. all the gloom and darkness is going to be overcome. But ultimately, he speaks of a child, he speaks of this, uh, a son who's truly a wonder counselor, a God hero, but ultimately uh, we can see it as Jesus, obviously. Right, right. But it, it is really God who's doing all these things through the Christ child, God who's going to be acting through the Messiah. Uh, so as bad as things can be, nothing is impossible with God. And, right. And, and everything's going to be worked out. This, and he's pretty graphic too because he talks of how <laughs> militarily how the, their enemy is going to be smashed. And right. It's pretty pretty powerful that their enemy eventually is, and that's what happened. Babylon does get smashed. Sure. And they get defeated. So it's an amazing and it's a hopeful reading that sets the stage for Jesus, the light of the world. You know. I think uh, there's one message here, and that is you know. You don't have to do anything. All you have to do is remain faithful. I'll do the rest. Right. I like that. Yeah. yeah. Very good. We ready? We're ready, Father. It's your turn. Okay. It's a, this is the epistle from the letter of St. Paul to Titus. Again, uh, Titus was certainly a <clears throat> companion of uh, uh, Paul and his journeys and becomes a bishop. Beloved, the grace of God has <clears throat> appeared, sa saving all training us to reject godless ways and worldly desires, to live temperately, justly, devoutly in this age as we await the blessed hope, the appearance of the glory of our great God, and Savior Jesus Christ, who gave <clears throat> himself for us to deliver us from lawlessness, to cleanse for himself people as his own, eager to do what is good. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. I, I find it's, it's a short reading, Stan, but in a way it refers to the first coming and the second coming. Mm -hmm. The grace of God has appeared, and it's a way of saying, yeah, Jesus has come, the Messiah, the grace, but he uses the word grace has appeared. Mm -hmm. I think that's a beautiful way. Saving all. And saving all. And then it says, we're awaiting the blessed hope the appearance of our Savior Jesus. So they're looking... For the second coming. The second right? coming. Mm -hmm. So the reading is, well, what do we do between the first and the second? And I think this reading is trying to tell the people how you're supposed to live. Live temperately, justly, and devoutly in this age. Yeah, that's the key. <clears throat> so yes, the Lord's come, and we look for him to come. In the meantime, we got business to take care of. And, and I like he even uses the word... Uh, He's training us. It's like they're, they're being a, a scold. This is a, yeah, you're exactly being, right. To be a disciple. It's uh, instructions on how to live a Christian it, life. He, Paul is teaching Titus how to teach, you know. Mm -hmm. We're trained the people, as you said. <clears throat> we got to reject all these worldly desires and, and heathen ways. And, uh, and then he speaks of lawlessness. You know, that's an interesting, Yeah, like things are out of control. But you said it well. So we live temperately, 
you know, we live with self-control, we live justly, we treat others fairly, and, and hopefully devoutly. Devoutly, we, we, we worship God with devotion and sincerity. So uh, this time between the two comings <coughs> is an important time, and we're in that in-between time state. We certainly are, Father. Yeah. Anything you'd like to Yeah, this is, uh, St. Paul actually is writing to Titus, and Titus is, uh, he's on the island of Crete. Crete. And uh, that's in the middle of the Mediterranean. Nice size island, by the way. But uh, Paul has never been there. So what he's doing is sending a letter there to try to boost Titus up on how to do things the right way. Mm -hmm. And I think that, that's, it's a very small letter. If you get in the Bible and look at it, it's probably one of the smallest yes. letters that there is in there. Only a couple pages. But uh, it, it's, it's, a, it's an instruction on how, to, how to, uh, to train your people there at Crete. You have to be uniform with the rest of us. You can't go your own way. This is what we got to do, mm -hmm. and he's trying to tell tell Titus that this is the this is the way of, way of the Lord that you have to uh, uh, adhere to what our, our teachings and make yeah, sure we're yeah. we're all the same. When you think of it, Stan, I think <clears throat> what he's saying to Titus and and the church in Crete <clears throat> really is appropriate today. I mean, oh, exactly right. I mean, we need to have self control. I mean, we you, you got to have temper, be temperate. Uh, we need to be just. I mean, that's. Yeah. And as a church, we've got to be uniform in our beliefs. Yeah, and devotion is to be truly sincere and humble in worship. Mm -hmm. Right. So I, it's amazing. You could read this letter, how old it is, and yet it really speaks to us today. Right. I think it certainly it's, does. It's very powerful. So it certainly is. So we are living between the first coming <clears throat> at Bethlehem between the second coming at the end. So. At the end of time. So we gotta be about the Lord's work. So. Exactly. Okay, Stan. We're ready. And here's the Christmas story, Father. This is, this is what it's all about, viewers. This, this is what it's about. This is the steak and the steak dinner. Yeah, I mean, to me, as a priest, this is, I read this gospel at all the masses because everybody should hear this gospel. Because it is what it is. This is what it's about. Right. Go ahead. Uh, Luke. Chapter 2, verses 1 to 14. <clears throat> In those days a decree went out from Caesar Augustus that the whole world should be enrolled. This was the first enrollment when Canarius was governor of Syria. So all went to be enrolled, each to his own town. And Joseph, too, went up from Galilee, from the town of Nazareth, to Judea, to the city of David that is called Bethlehem, because he was of the house and the family of David, to be enrolled with Mary, his betrothed, who was with child. While they were there, the time came for her to have her child. She gave birth to her firstborn son. She wrapped him in swaddling clothes and laid him in a manger, because there was no room for them in the inn. Now there were shepherds in that region, living in the fields, and keeping the night watch over their flock. The angel of the Lord appeared to them, and the glory of the Lord shone about them, and they were struck with great fear. The angel said to them, Do not be afraid, for behold, I proclaim to you good news of great joy that will be for all the people. For today in the city of David a Savior has been born for you, who is Christ and Lord. And this will be a sign for you, that you will find an infant wrapped in swaddling clothes and lying in a manger. And suddenly there was a multitude of the heavenly host with the angel, praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest, and on earth peace on those whom his favor rests. This is the gospel of the Lord, Father. Praise to you, Lord Jesus Christ. And there's the story, Father. And That's it. It is, and it, it shows that to, for Jesus to come from, from the place that he came from, and you look at everything I talked earlier about, the, the lowest of the lows, everything that was the most pity for a mini minuscule the whole thing you look at you look at the uh, uh, they had to stay in a, in a, in a you know, stable because there was no room for them in the end they couldn't even get in a place where people were they were so low they they end up uh, <clears throat> the child is born so they put him in swaddling clothes which is just basically wrapped with any rag that you might have at the yeah, time just strips yeah, need, strips of clothes yeah. uh, put him in a manger which is a a fodder place for, for, the, for the animals to eat, which yeah. is pretty, uh, there's a lot of significance there. I like oh, that. Oh, no, it's I like that. I think it's so powerful. Yeah, and then you got the, the low life of society, the, the poor old shepherds that are out there, probably 
half boozed up and just watching their, their flock. I'm sure they didn't smell very good. <laughs> they didn't good. smell very good. And they, sm they smelled like the sheep, you know. That's right. They, they have to be like the sheep. So they, they smell like the sheep. So the angel appears to them, to the lowest of the low, and tells them, this is what's happening, guys. You know, go and see. Go and see. And so there, there it is. All, all the, the lowest things in society and, and, and the lowest part of, of uh, human life at that time is right there in a nutshell to show where, where Jesus came from absolutely positively, the lowest of the lowest mm -hmm. of the human, the human race. Yeah, yeah. It, 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 this story is just so powerful. Uh, and I think the beginning is kind of interesting because the census from Caesar Augustus, you know, is, uh, it, 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 it sets, sets the birth of Christ in this global event, uh, this big census. And remember that Caesar Augustus saw himself as a god. Huh? He saw himself as a savior, and you had to worship him, or you were in big trouble, or worse. Exactly right. So Caesar was almost acting as a god, and and so remember, Luke is a physician, but he's also a historian. He has a sense of history. And but I think I think with Luke. You know, if you look at where he was at with the people he, he spent time with, he spent time with Paul. Paul uh, was very much of an influence with him. And I got to think with, with Luke's story of, of the birth of Christ that he spent some time on Patmos as well with John and with, with Mary and, and talked to Mary about what was going on. He has to have that information yeah. from someplace. Yeah. So, I mean, I, there's this global thing with Augustus. <clears throat> but then he, he, he kind of notes Joseph, you know, that, Joseph, you know, you know, was, why does he go to Bethlehem? Because Joseph is of the house of David. The linkage of Joseph to <clears throat> David is so important here because then Jesus has a connection to David and to the promises made to David. It's very important. Sprout shall burst forth from the root of Jesse. We've been reading all about these promises. And so it's very important that Luke keeps Joseph and the fact that he's a house of David and, and Jesus has this strong connection now, uh, it's, it's, it's very beautiful. It certainly is. It's a beautiful connection here. Uh, <clears throat> and, uh, and I like what you're saying, the poverty is, is striking. I mean, the birth of Christ could have took place a lot easier, a lot less stressful. Well, sure. But, you know, it takes place in a stable, really, with animals. Everything that God seems to do takes us by surprise. It does. So I guess he's only preparing us for what will happen later, you know, mm -hmm. that we'll be even more surprised when Jesus dies on the cross, you know. This, this whole thing is, is nothing but uh, a cavalcade of surprises, Father. And like the, the image, it says, there was no room for them in the end, okay? But that says a lot because many people, there was no room in their heart for Jesus when he did come. Mm -hmm. uh, there was, symbolically, there's no room in people's hearts, so a lot of people rejected Jesus, rejected his <clears throat> message. So I think that's a very powerful statement. You know, it certainly is. You know, um, you know and... And I do like the image of the shepherds. I mean, uh, of all the people to first have the message announced, these were not the ones you would pick. But you've got to think later on, Jesus becomes the shepherd of the people. Yeah, yeah. So. And in a way, shepherds are linked to King David, who was a shepherd. shepherd. So exactly. th the connections are really striking here, you know, that house of David, Shepherds, King David, a shepherd. Uh, it's beautiful. And the manger. You and put him manger. in a manger. The manger is a place where, where animals feed. Yep. Uh, and Jesus is there as food for us, Father. He's food for... As, as in the Eucharist at every, every Mass. He, he continues to feed his people. Mm -hmm. you know? And I think... And then, you know, thinking at the end with the angels, it's... Uh, their message is so powerful and so strong, you know... Uh, they're singing out glory to God in the highest and our earth peace and on earth peace to those who believe and, and their message that a, there's a savior been born. Uh, 
you get the sense this is something, the beginning of something new, a new age, a dawn of a new time. And we still use the first part of the angel's war, uh, message as well, every mass, the glory. Yes, we do. The glory to God in the highest. We keep that spirit of the angels. Mm -hmm. of, when Christ comes, it's, it's a new beginning, a fresh start for all of us. Uh, and it's, it's, it's very powerful, you know, that, and angels do it in such a dramatic way when they announce it. Uh, right. That this is, and it, this new age is coming, and it's, it's coming because the Savior and Messiah is born, you know. Uh, the long promised one. And the wrong, and you sort of sense, again with the reading, like you've said before, about promises and fulfillment. Right. You really sense in this reading that. There it is. That everything is coming together. That, Isaiah comes to life in the gospel. The history is being fulfilled. The mm -hmm. promises of God are, are being made concrete. They're, they're taking flesh. Uh, fulfillment is, is, is all over the place. It's, it's it absolutely there. is. It fills this reading. And <clears throat> so uh, it, it's just a wonderful reading. But when you think of what it means, uh, and that's what's so wonderful, we have our, next to stand, we have our stable, we have our, or crash, all the figures are there, of course, except except for the manger and it's Jesus. Jesus isn't there yet. Uh, we keep them to Christmas Eve, of course. Right. We keep them. So, but I think uh, so well. We mentioned last week at <coughs> Saint Francis of Assisi, 800 years ago, established the first living Crush, manger right. scene, mm -hmm. crash, and uh, I think it's it, it transcends words. You know, it makes the gospel story come alive. It certainly know. does. You know, so for our viewers, I, I do hope that you really listen to the reading and I hope that you can really ponder it and let that reading soak in because so much in it, it mean, everything means something in that reading. Oh, exactly right. Everything, everything means something. Anything else you want to say, Steve? No, Father, I think if, if, all the readings match together very well. They all have a message, and they all seem to, to flow from one to the other to the yeah. other. I think it's really, really, really good. I, Perfect I think, readings. I think these readings for the night mass of Christmas, are, they're powerful, they're, they're wonderful, um, and they're so hopeful. Huh? They're so filled with hope. So please, again, just read them over ahead of time and ponder them, and, because you never get tired of them, Stan. Right. But we're gonna move on, and we're gonna conclude. I, Stan and I are just going to share some reflections with you on Chris, what Christmas means to us, uh, a personal, what Christmas means to us, and uh, because for all of us, we all have a lot of traditions, things. Huh? So Stan, why don't you start off for us? Okay. Um, to me, uh, the, the Christmas is like in two parts <laughs> for me. Um, for us, our family gets together Christmas Eve, and we used to do a little bit later in the evening, but this year we're doing a little bit earlier because our family is growing and uh, my grandchildren are becoming adults, and they oh, are adults. Okay. And so they've got people in their lives that they need to share their, their lives with as well. So sure. uh, we're doing ours a little bit earlier this year, and uh, that's a good thing. Yeah. That's a good thing. And uh, Christmas, like I said, the two parts of it, the first part is, is with family. And, and uh, you can celebrate this time of, of Jesus' birth together and with the exchanging of gifts and like that. Everybody does that, I guess. But, but for us, uh, I think, it uh, doesn't matter what I get. It's just that they say, Pap, what do you want? What, what do you want? I just want us to be together. It says it all. It says it all. It says it, it. Says it all. And, and as long as you celebrate together, I think that, that's part of that family commitment. And I think uh, for us people that's living in this area, it came from, from ethnic backgrounds. I think it means a lot because I think the, the value of family is kind of instilled mm -hmm. in, in, uh, in our, our family as we were growing up. I'm sure you're gonna probably talk about that too. But uh, uh, that's part one, yeah. family together. Found the present family together. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> Second part for Christmas to me, Father, is, uh, uh, is whenever, I'm, after it's all over, after the smoke is cleared, the lights are, are still on the Christmas tree and my wife goes to bed and, and uh, uh, it's quiet. And now I can reflect. I can reflect on what Advent meant to me this year. 
and I can also reflect on, um, I don't know, Christmases that were years ago. Yeah, the and past. If, and at that back. point in time, I, I, can, I can spend some time with my family that are gone right now, with my parents and with you know, my uncles and aunts mm -hmm. and, and people that were you know, very important to me. And to me, that's, that's the second part of Christmas. Mm -hmm. you, you're, you're still the past and, and the present meshes together. And, and knowing full well that, that in due time we'll all be together again. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, uh, I was going to say the same basic thing that the importance of family. Uh, <clears throat> it's so important. And what you finished with is uh, being connected with those who are no longer with us is very important. For me, it is. Uh, it's, uh, you think about the people who aren't here, you know. It's, it's, it's pretty special, you know. But also family, and, and when you're a priest, you can't uh, celebrate Christmas Eve, so you have to wait. I don't know how you guys do it. So, uh, but, so on Christmas, we try to get together because uh, I'm working Christmas Eve. <laughs> you got a family here, Father. You got 416 families. Yep. So, uh, but one of the things we uh, always enjoyed was sharing the Christmas wafer of the Plotki, you know. Uh -huh. it, it just has a sense of one of the nice traditions of uh, Christmas, you know, the sharing of the wafer and, and making a toast. And, uh, the ethnic foods, Father, what about the ethnic foods? Of course, you have the ethnic foods. Oh, yeah. We, we do <laughs> some, you know, the, uh, you know, we have meat, a meatless type of meal. Or use some of it was me, you know, things that are, you know, we have a, a mushroom type soup, different things that are a linkage to the past. That's so nice, you know. Right, it certainly is. Yeah. Uh, so I think families is, is, it makes Christmas special. But then you come to church and you realize you're part of a bigger, bigger family. Bigger family, absolutely. You, you know, that it's nice to see people come to church. On Christmas Eve, especially usually Christmas Eve with their little ones, yeah. it's a real family type setting, you know. Especially the the first mass at four thirty with the children, and that's the wild one. Father. The way it, it's going to be, <laughs> you know, everything happens that mass, and that's good. That's a good thing. But it it gives a sense of yeah, we're St. Mary's Parish family, you know. And you so. see the, the the youthful enthusiasm. That yeah. you have at that 4:30 mass. It every is. every mass that you have has got a different uh, personality. Yes, <laughs> we will have a children's choir, and uh, they will be in costume. <laughs> nice. And uh, it'll be interesting. Uh, and uh, we may even have some special uh, musicians for our 4:30 this year, Stan. Nice. I, I think we're going to have a. A violin and a cello player this year. So nice. So nice. So I think the 4:30 is going to be very special this year. So, but another thing, family I think is number one. I think right. absolutely. And and the second thing I just throw out, I know we're running out of time, is peace because peace was a part of the message of the angels, and uh, we, we realize. Uh, the Savior Jesus came to to bring a world his peace to a world that's very troubled and we know right now our world is, is really troubled. It's a, it's a mess. It's a mess with all the fighting, the wars going mm -hmm. on and the conflicts and all the violence. Uh, there's such a lack of peace and yet Christmas does something. It, it, it stirs in the hearts of everybody a desire for peace. It really desires that we, we need to find a way to live together and live in harmony. And, and uh, hopefully this Christmas will move the hearts of all people, especially world leaders, to kind of work more to getting <clears throat> along and more to respecting each other, you know. No, Father, I think you've said it all. That's what the world needs. Yeah, I, so I, I just think that, you know, at least for a while, people hopefully will stop fighting. At least for a couple of days. Anyway. At least they hope they stop fighting. 
even in uh, World War One and Two, they took uh, time off, you know. And, and they, they they came out of the, in World War One. They actually came out of their trenches and and, and socialized. They, yes, they they <laughs> actually stopped fighting in World. I think they even sang together or yeah. something. Yeah. Two I, days later, they're shooting. They're shooting, time. but for those two days, there was some yeah. peace. And, yeah. And can you imagine singing together your, with your enemy or something? You know, all that shows for me, Father, is there's still, <coughs> there's still hope for us. There is hope. <laughs> I often think of the. Uh, I know this is dumb, but Snoopy and the Red Baron. That's sure. a song. You know, mm -hmm. it sort of symbolizes for that little time. There's peace, and if there can be peace for two days, maybe we can have peace. We can work on that. That's a start. At least that's a start. We yeah. we could do better, you know. Absolutely. And uh, maybe one more thing I'll just throw out, maybe just to wrap it up because sure. I think we're going to be done. Is I think Christmas does mean giving and sharing, and uh, I'm always struck by the generosity of people uh, to the church, to me. I'm struck by the generosity, uh, you know, say at our food pantry, uh, uh, being a our generous donors, benefactors, our volunteers to to help so many people. Uh, and you've seen it all come together. You, know, and, you were there last week and we were for our Christmas distribution and yeah. you saw it all come together. It's, it's a beautiful thing. People, you know, they, people go out of their way to be generous, to be, to find a way of helping and, and, and you know, they really go way out of their way for others. And that's a wonderful part and of it. And if we can get 10 faith groups to work together without fighting, surely the world leaders can uh, take that as an example and maybe try to do the same thing. I think so, yeah. So, I, I mean, uh, the, the food pantry is just an example. There's so many, you read the news, and so many people are doing wonderful things and sharing and helping and, and doing all kinds of things for people in need. and. Uh, it is truly a part of Christmas. And Christmas can be every day, Father. People are in need 365 yeah. days of the year. So Christmas should not stop. Just, just from the 25th, so. So we're gonna end with a prayer and, uh, and a blessing, okay? We're ready, Father. The prayer for Christmas. <clears throat> Gracious, Gracious God, God, you have, have filled, filled us with new hope for the, the future by coming, coming among, among us. us. Do not, Do not be afraid, your angels told the shepherds, and we know those words are also meant for us. Born in a Bethlehem stable, you came to destroy the fear that can keep us bound to sin. With your presence now in our hearts, we are free to love and be loved without limit. Thank you for the gifts of family, friends, and faith. May this Christmas season strengthen us to spread, spread your joy and peace in service to your people. Amen. And may God's blessing come upon you in a very special way at Christmas. May he fill you with his peace and joy, protect you from the power of all evil, and truly bless you and your loved ones. In the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. And on behalf of Stan and also Carol up in our control room, and myself, we... We wish you a very blessed, very joyous Christmas. Merry Christmas, everyone. See you next week. Okay.